very, very intelligent and that he can broaden my horizons and my mindset on cooking, on wealth, on entrepreneurship, and I just want to learn more from him. My expectations for the Chefpreneur Academy is to pretty much learn uh, different aspects of the food service and learn more techniques and more so the business side. Um, when I was in A school with Chef Ponder, that was uh, real long ago. So, um, I mean, me myself, it's always great to see um, people you know, people that you work with be successful um, in and outside the Navy. Uh, I love the aspect because a lot of people don't understand how what you do in the Navy can transfer to the civilian world and you can be successful with what you learn in the Navy. So one thing, um, I'm an open book. I always, I never stop learning. So I never have the aspect that I can't learn something new. So I'm absolutely sure there's gonna be new stuff that I will learn here that I'll be able to put in my toolbox to use um, when I do uh, retire. Being that it's day four at Chefpreneur Academy, things are going great. I really appreciate being able to come here. We are in the kitchen now. We're uh, prepping right now. Being that we're in teams right now, the communication is going great. We got two people out here setting up the tables. We got I got my two other chefs in the kitchen. I am the executive chef, and we're doing great right now. We're doing our cuts, making sure our meat is uh, together, doing our sauces and things like that, and we're all working good as a team. What I've enjoyed most about being at the Chef Newer Academy this week is being able to get new learning experiences and learning how to start and market a business. This experience for me um, as Chef Newer gives me a chance to go back to when I was a junior sailor. Um, and being able to see what our rate is about, not just being in the galley, um, but being able to expand out of the galley. I don't deny there's some strange evolutionary... Uh, my passion has been restored. It brought back all the old memories of working in civilian world, uh, doing all the cooking that I used to, what I love, how I used to do it, and uh, it's going to push me forward and push me through the next four years of the shit that I'm at now. What up, what up, hell, everybody? It's me, Chef Ponder. You guys can hear me. My sound is good. We'll be back with a quick episode. Tonight, get your pen in your pad. We're going to dive in on a lot of great stuff, a lot of great information, uh, as we did a couple weeks ago. And I got uh, my favorite guest, man, Mr. Eric. What's going on, Eric? How you doing, Chef? How you doing today? All it, man. Busy, busy, man. Busy day, busy day. But busy days are, are always good, I guess. Long well, the progress. What's new? What's going on with you? Uh, just a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things going on. Again, you know, uh, in the industry, uh, connecting with chefs. Um, I'm in the process of a move myself. Like I think I've talked to you about moving to transitioning to Florida, right. but trying to um, connect with uh, a lot of new reps, uh, introducing them to customers that I've worked with for, you know, some of them two decades or more, and I'm trying to make sure that they're all settled and, and going to be taken care of properly as I as I move to my my new situation uh, in Florida again doing the same thing you know working with customers but yeah it's a uh, gotcha. it's exciting gotcha gotcha so I think last time we was on here we got into a lot of great things um, talked a little bit about uh, ordering uh, acquisition food procurement I wanted to talk this time more about um, kind, kind of the same thing but I was talking to a restaurant owner maybe two two weeks ago here in Atlanta, and uh, he was just telling me how they're getting hammered right now with, with um, not being able to sustain um, food costs. Like, you know, the variations are all over the place. So a lot of people are, are cooking more at home, and restaurants are silently suffering uh, that impact. 
And I think something happened with um, with some of the produce. We know eggs is a big thing right now. I think eggs continue to be a big thing. I seen something the other day with FDA or not FDA. Somebody put out that uh, eggs are now causing um, blood clots in some people. So uh, I don't know what's going on with that piece right there. Um, but here in Atlanta, the price of lamb has skyrocketed. Lamb is tight, very tight, <laughs> very tight. Throughout the entire uh, region, uh, and more specifically, we're talking about uh, uh, the the rack of lamb now, not the lamb chop. People, I think, get it misconstrued. A lamb chop and a rack of lamb is, is a different variation cut of meat. The lamb chops are doing well at Sam's Club right now. Uh, but I just wanted to talk more. I, I'm, all, I'm also in this group at Facebook for restaurant owners. Um, it's about 48,000 people in there in this group. And a lot of the conversations, I'll bring it up here in a second, a lot of the conversations is just how um, how they're just impacted by prices, man. Like, as, as it impacted anything on your end as far as like uh, uh, new orders, new accounts, old accounts, people kind of going different directions now rather than ordering from you all or what's it looks like? So it's um, it's a great question because it's really, it really depends on, because then basically an operator has a couple options. You know, do they raise prices? Do they change something about what they're doing? Um, and, or is it a combination of both? So right. that's one of the things that I really do work a lot with my customers on is, you know, when we have, again, whether it's eggs, you know, granted, it's hard to replace eggs <laughs> with, with something other than eggs, that's but, true. you know, but then, and that's one of the things that as a consultant where I'm coming in and like, do we look at liquid eggs? You know, are you looking in uh, an alternate product that you can still use to execute your dish? Maybe you're doing ingredient with it. You know, you're not cracking eggs or, you know, there's always the right product for the right application. Um, medium eggs end up being cheaper than the rest of the eggs. So if it's just ingredient, you're not putting it out for a breakfast and you want a certain size egg, can you get away with using medium eggs, which are usually less expensive? So a lot of the focus as we try to manage food costs um, have to do with understanding like what you're buying and mm -hmm. what that application is. And are there different, um, different products you can use to, uh, to address the same thing, to be able to control costs, still keep a consistent product and a consistent experience for your guests but to be able to, you know, still be able to make money, not have to price yourself out of the market. So that's a lot of what we really focus on um, in trying to have those discussions on almost a, a weekly basis as to what are you using, you know, what's going on in the market and how can we can that, how can we manage it? Wow. So, so say you guys try to dip your prices in order to help compensate for locations or you kind of like that. It's just, this is the price you guys. I mean, it's, it's a, game. honestly, it's a combination. So like, you know, from the way our company works, um, I mean, our, our focus is, is the customer, you know, so our, you know, we don't, we don't make money. We don't, I mean, our whole goal is to make sure that our customers stay in business because the only way that we can grow our sales is if they grow. Right. So we really are, completely focused on trying to make sure that they're successful. So yeah, if it, if it has to do with, you know, if someone's buying a lot of an item and we need to try to, uh, to get deals put in the system or get something to, to help in that fashion. Again, a lot of times you can't, it's just the market change and scarcity or whatever the issue is drives up cost. Um, yep. we're able to help as much as we can, but then making sure that, we dial in on exactly what the product, I mean, you brought up lamb chops. Lamb chops is a great example for a couple yes. of reasons. One, lamb chops, how many people are paying attention to the size racks? I mean, if you're talking New Zealand racks, they're from a uh, 10 to 12 ounce all the way up to an 18, 22 ounce. So are you making sure that your portion, you know, what you're pricing and what you're serving is a proper portion to be able to bring, you know, to to deliver those, uh, the financial, uh, rewards that you're looking for. So are you dialed into portion costs? You know, are you, you know, serving the right rack to make that money? Great, great point. I know I, I spoke to a, um, a gentleman who's from California. He has a, um, 
a restaurant out in Napa, I think it was, and he was telling me the, the portions he was serving. He was serving up to like almost five five bones of the French. He said, dude, it's way too much um, to serve. But he was, he, he was, you know, telling me the sides of the lamb. So I gave him some suggestion pieces this is for anybody um, that's a restaurant owner or I, I know some, uh, good chefs know this, um, but to take advantage of other cuts of meat, you know, we could do we could do lamb shanks. You could do all kind of variations of lamb, man. I mean, t- tonight I actually did lamb shanks tonight here at the house to see how they go. You can shred them and you know re- repurpose them, but you don't have to always stick with what's latest and greatest. Um, what else? Let's see. So I want to talk about this website again because last time we didn't really get a chance to, to dive in. A lot sure. of great resources on here, man. Um, so supplier comment, change comments. So could you? help navigate us through this site real quick and tell us some good resources. Because I want, I want the, the people watching to kind of know, uh, if, you, if you're not a, a Cisco um, a customer, uh, just going on the site, it's a lot of great information for restaurant owners, chefs, suppliers, everybody, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah. kind of walk us through some, some good points that we could, we could probably reference. So there's a great, I mean, it, it's a great tool, especially if you're trying to, you know, really um, get your finger on the pulse of what's going on for multiple reasons for yourself um, to understand what's going on, you know, that's driving the, uh, the produce market. I mean, produce is probably one of the most volatile categories within food service where you can have lettuce. Uh, and very recently, lettuce was almost $100 a case in Romaine and Iceberg. And now it's back into like the $30 range. So it's very, um, very volatile because uh, growing regions change. Um, you'll have stuff that's, uh, there's a shortage of product because a certain growing region might not be ready yet because of weather. Um, there's reporting on here that lets you know exactly what's going on with the markets, what's high, what's not. Again, same thing with the other commodities. Like if you're trying to understand why chicken wings were $140 a case last year and now they went back down to the forties and now they're coming back up. So, yeah. you know, it gives you a lot of details as to market wise, what's going on. Cause especially if you're an operator and you're trying to figure out, I mean, this is, it gets so difficult trying to figure out like, what do you do? You know, you need to raise prices sometimes, but the prices are all over the place. Like, how do you, how do you set a price that, uh, you know that you don't want you don't want to make it too low because then you're not making your money if you make it too high then you lose sales so and with the markets jumping all over the place it makes it very tricky really really difficult you do, but um that what, report what, is what great. do you do i'm sorry Richard, what, sure. what do you do as an owner operator i mean you're, i'm not sure if you ever own brick and mortar but you you know a lot about it in your years what do you do as a as an owner operator when chicken wing prices jump that high and it's, it's kind of affecting your bottom line. Well, I'll tell you what, um, a good rule of thumb, and then, then this is what I, I speak to a lot of uh, a lot of my customers about doing, is trying to set, one, trying to set pricing at the high. So if you know that chicken wings, um, the highest they've been, say, is, you know, it's hitting $120 a case, you know, and then, you know, it's a, if you're buying a jumbo wing, which I think is probably the, um, the most purchased or the it's at least the one that we sell the most of and that's a a six to eight or six to nine count wing and you're getting in a 40 pound case you're getting 280 wings you know you break it down at that high what that's costing you uh per unit and then you kind of figure out on the high um what you need to sell it for in order to make your money so a lot of it is trying to take a look at and the same thing applies for whether you have a steak on your menu or chicken take a look at where is it historically as a high and working on trying to set your pricing or set your portions based on that. So that way, if that market hits, hits, you know, at the top, you're still going to be making money. And then if the market drops off, you're just going to be making more money, but at least you're not going to be losing. I mean, the whole point right now is to make sure that you don't run out of business because all of a sudden there's not enough profit to cover all your expenses and, you know, and take care of yourself. But that's, I think, a, a good strategy. Um, that also, that whole strategy about trying to control what you can has to do with yeah. product, you know, what products you use. Um, I'm a big proponent of, if you want to talk about produce again, and we talked about how volatile the produce market is, looking into pre-cuts, 
you know, those, uh, whereas if you're just buying commodity lettuce and you're buying, you know, whether it's a 24 head case of romaine or iceberg and it's going all over the place, you can buy that pre-chopped fresh lettuce that's chopped. The companies that produce that have contracts. So they contract out with the growers for oh. six months, a year. So you'll see much yeah. less fluctuation. Um, buying that type of a product because now you know again you're getting a hundred percent yielded product you know that right. if you're doing a five ounce portion of remain for your caesar it's really not going to move that much so you can set that menu price and have that consistency so again a lot of that kind of really dialing into what products you're using what's going to give you that products that, that pricing stability and uh you know and then setting your price accordingly wow yeah I mean, it's it's a lot to go into consideration, and I know certain certain markets are, are saturated with certain types of food. Some people are sometimes afraid to to go outside that realm. And like you said, the make or buy situation. That's the rule of thumb that I went by. We I worked for uh, a couple of different companies. It was a, a make or buy, and the rule of thumb was if 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 we bought it pre cut, what was the price point versus having a, a cook or a prep cook at twelve dollars an hour <laughs> sit here and chop all that lettuce up um and the one thing i'm a big proponent of is the consistency you get when you have pre-chopped or pre pre-cut things um which tilts the scale a little bit on your your uh, labor costs um what about menu so you guys have uh do you guys have any options for and i'm just thinking that's for questions that i got received over the past couple of days uh the chefs mm-hmm. are asking as far as like um their their menus that's a big thing i see reoccurring is um they don't really know how to create a menu and set the menu and go back to the uh price so you guys got some information on here there is a lot of um there's a lot of information on a lot of things but uh and the menu is the menu is so important because it doesn't it almost doesn't matter how good your food is if people like especially when you're looking at the menu a lot of times you know, unless you have fantastic servers, which I know it's always a struggle trying to get, you know, servers trained so that they can represent your food properly. So because of that constant struggle, it's always very important to have a very strong menu and your menu needs to direct your customer to what you want them to buy. So if you're just putting food, you know, a list of product, you know, I'm sorry, list of uh, items and a price on the menu, what is that saying to your customer? That's why, again, you get into, again, you're like the menu services. Cisco mm-hmm. has designers all over the all over the country that does uh, menu designs for customers, for big projects, for partners that want to partner up. There's also menu services that customers can do their own menus uh, on the on the platform. Um, wow. But learning but i mean again there's a we can do a whole series on 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 that but in terms of like how you write your menu you know and what you're trying to get people to buy because if you're not boxing it starring it you know there's there's a whole study about location of product on the menu um menu engineering there's so many things that are all interconnected as to what should be on your menu you know you want people as an operator do you want them, you know, if you, you know, your your best real estate part in your one page menu is right in dead center. What items did you put dead center on your menu? Is it, you know, something that you're making your most money on or is it something that, you know, you're not? So, again, there's a lot of there's a lot of science behind how you write a menu, let alone the services to do it. But this is what a lot of those uh, menu um, the menu designers do is they look at that they'll ask those questions. Do you know the food costs and the profitability of your menu? So before you go to write a menu, have you done the food costing, at least the theoretical food costing of what is your profit per per item? So you want to put your most profitable items in the best real estate, drawing attention to those items so that you sell the most of them and make the most money you can. And, and, you know, I, I remember in culinary school, we had to do the same project. And one of the things that stuck out was, um, and this is, whole, like you said, a lot of science behind it, but the psychology behind this, people typically, when they open up a menu, their eyes go to the top right corner. Right. And that's, that's, that's researching, you know what I'm saying? And then uh, I 
think it's the top right corner, then it's the center. And uh, you, you would see typically your your, your high price items in those top right corners or right in the center, just your, you know, whatever porterhouse, your, your nice cuts of meats and, you know, the pricey stuff. All, also with that, something we learned was how you uh, write out your prices, whether it's a dollar sign beside it, whether it's not a dollar sign beside it, whether it's like that, 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 that. Uh, whether it's nine, it was a ninety-nine or fifty-nine or sixty-nine behind it. There's so many uh, uh, nuances to writing a, a correct menu, and it also depends on the type of service you got too. You know, if you got more, more fine dining menus, you won't see dollar signs on it typically. Uh, you see stuff like at market price for some of the seafood, um, and it, I, I guess it just depends on what you're doing. If you got a food truck, I don't think it really would matter. Um, if you got a mom, most mom and pop spots, you see that dot, 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 and the 99 is out beside it. So, um, a lot of, um, a lot of things you have to consider look into, but most importantly, like you said earlier was costing out your food, man. Like, uh, there's a lot of things I know, uh, here in Atlanta, a lot of the personal and private chefs, some they just don't do. I'm not saying everybody don't do it. The ones, the ones I know, the ones that, that has, uh, Ask the question about it. They, you know, at best, if it's if it's a hundred people, they may do it for about ten bucks a person. It's a thousand bucks. They try to go spend four, three to four hundred dollars on food in their pocket. The rest of the money for themselves, and, and to them, that's their profit. Um, which I'm like, they didn't consider equipment, you know, travel, uh, van setup, breakdown, servers. Nothing is considered other than that that, that one mm-hmm. juicy number. I've also seen restaurants fail because they failed to do research on the pricing. Uh, uh, back in Virginia, I had to do a couple of consulting pieces for a couple of restaurants. And the one thing that I noticed was they were just making up stuff. Man. They, they really just made shit up. Like, it's one, like, oh, let's do chicken and waffles. Well, what kind of chicken? Chicken tenders, the big wings, the small wings, the drummies. What are we doing? Are we breading them or are we not breading them? And one guy's like, it doesn't matter if they break. It matters because if you bread it, then your grease is going to break down quicker. You're gonna, it's just a whole lot of nuances that goes behind the, the method to the madness that people don't look into that, that can uh, cause a lot of restaurants to not fail. And la- lastly, I was I was a part of a conversation about two, two months ago uh, where this investor was talking to this great restaurant in Atlanta. I won't say who it is, but it's a great restaurant in Atlanta. Um, and they're a Black-owned establishment. And... They were doing. They were doing awesome. Like they were. They were breaking into coins, um, big time. Um, and they had to put the the brick and mortar up for sale because they fell behind on their bills. Making money hand over fist, man, and just not paying bills. It caused them to, to about to foreclose. And they, they was pitching it to this guy to invest. And I think he needed something like it was like a, a, a low ball number. Like I don't know. I would say like fifteen to twenty five thousand. To, to stay afloat and keep it going. Um, but he was asking them, you know, what's your what, what's your uh, margin? What's your profitability range on, on your menu? And they had no idea. And this guy, this guy named, he's not a foodie guy. Like, he's just a numbers guy. And asking them these hardcore questions. They've been in business for three years. They've been chilling it for three years. But now they're looking at the doors going to close because they don't know how to maintain their books. They don't know how to set those profit margins. So, you know, that's... It's scary. I mean, and and that's especially with the way prices have gone. If you're not, I mean, that was the one thing that COVID did a lot of it. It it washed out a lot of the operators that didn't have those controls. So if you don't have that, you know, really dialed into your food costs, if you're not doing those inventories to make sure that you're maintaining that profitability, because you need to do that so that way you're able to see like if all of a sudden your food cost is you know everybody talks about a 33 percent food cost if all of a sudden your food cost is at 50 percent well you just lost a lot of money that means that you're not nearly as profitable and your other costs are going up your employees cost more than ever uh yeah. your rent you know gas all those other costs have gone up as well that if you're not um you know dialed into that and you're not, uh, you know, basically making those changes on your menu to accommodate. That's going to be what's going to happen. You're like you're busy, and everybody's looking. Oh, I don't understand why they fail <laughs> because they're busy. But without those controls, um, it's it's scary. And then one thing I want to mention too, which you mentioned about, there are a lot of people that are doing catering or doing, you know, they have you know small businesses themselves, mm-hmm. which, you know, they they have a they try to create a very simple. Um, way of making uh, making a profit. So they sold a $1,000 catering job. 
they know that they need to you know only spend a certain amount of money right i like to talk about like what is your end game in terms of mm. consistency because you're going and like i know you know this because there's a reason why you're hired by the your customers and the celebrities that hire you is because you set an expectation of how consistent you are so what i see also have which is a big a big i think uh pitfall is that when these these uh, uh operators are looking for answers and the easy button is let me buy something cheaper or let me see what i can do to spend less yeah. and it might be a quick what they think is a quick fix but it could be something that can really impact their business i mean say you're a customer who loves you know, whether it's that burger, whether it's that chicken, you know, and you keep coming back, you hire them because you love that food. And all of a sudden, the next time they order it, they're talking to all their friends about it. It's not as good because it's different. You change the product. So yeah. that is a very quick way of potentially going out of business and losing business because you need to make sure that you build your business based on consistency. You want to put out that best product you can and be consistent at it so that way you can build that residual business. Those, those uh, repeat customers that love your experience, can't wait to hire you again and to talk to your friend, their friends about it. And that's how you build a, a business that's going to last you and take care of your family and allow you to build. And if you want to become a brick and mortar, that's how you do it. It's that consistency mm. and getting that quality out there. And then you build with that same mentality you know, build that. And, you know, if you need to charge more because it costs you more, you can justify it because you're, you're, you're giving them the product that they want. I mean, if you give, if you really do separate yourself from your competitors by putting out a superior product, you're not competing against anybody. No, you're no, not. no, 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 they're, they're, they're reaching, reaching for that, that, that dollar sign. Man. And I know a lot of people, what you just said, was scared the heck out of them is buying, I would say the most expensive cut, but you know, you want if I'm gonna buy some beef, I want to get the highest rate beef as I can for my customers, right? right? People are literally buying the bottom of the barrel beef to save on money and, and you know they'll, they'll get by by seasoning and dressing it up a little bit. I learned a trick years ago at most in most Chinese food places, <laughs> they take the poor cuts of meat, and I mean like the cuts of meat you wouldn't feed to your dog, and they soak it in baking soda. Hmm. As a tenderizer. Yep. And then they serve it to you as beef and broccoli. I mean, and it, and it is just the crappiest cuts of meat you ever had in your life. But you wouldn't know that, though. I mean, the type of the, you know, put the sauce and, and the hoisin and the teriyaki glaze on it, you have no idea. So I would say it's up to the individual. Like me, I have a little bit more integrity. So I, I tell my, my customers, listen, my price point is going to be higher. My food, because... I shop at Whole Foods, you know, I shop at Trader Joe's, I shop at places that I think they have a, a good reputation for uh, right. quality ingredients, you know. Um, now, will I go to other places if I don't have anything? Of course, you know, but I hate, I hate something out, you know. But that's one thing I put, I put in the forefront is the quality of ingredients. You hire Chef Condor, his, 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 some, some people don't hire you. Some people will not, will not, some people will just, you know, poke and gals to see what your prices are. And to say, well, you're expensive. Like, well, that's just my prices are. So chefs I'm talking to you, you can't be afraid to lose business. You can't get all the business. Rather than doing 15 catering gigs, imagine just doing four big ones and not 15 small ones. You know, just do four big ones at a very high quality, at a very, you know, high um, high rate. And then you don't have to do 15. But a lot of people just get started. And they want to get, get the handle of everything they can get. And what I've been seeing is they're charging $1,000. And, and, and then they're literally, I'm telling you, man, they're literally go from store to store trying to only spend three hundred dollars and pocket seven hundred dollars and thinking that you know wow those are those are big profits and um another thing is your plate size too right um, also matters that's why you see a lot of uh celebrity chefs or fancy chefs get away with putting small portions of food on the plate and charge two three hundred dollars for that portion for that that's the best cut of meat like that's the best top chef caviar yes it's a spoonful of it but th those are the best ingredients and that's what keep the customers coming back. Um, then in places where they serve fried chicken all day, and that's the best fried chicken ever. But they, they got the best 
chicken. They got the best grease. They got the best flour. Like everything is the best. And that's some things they would take a look at. Um, so, wow. Very I mean, funny. think about, I mean, here's something else to think about too. Like if you're doing catering, you know, there's, I mean, everything is so connected, like in terms of how you serve it. You know, we always talk about if someone's doing a party and there's something that's really expensive, maybe you're doing shrimp, maybe you're doing, um, you know, tornados, you're doing something with filet mignon or something very expensive. Well, maybe you butler those. You have someone who's maybe helping to party where now you're controlling versus putting it all out as a buffet. And people are obviously going to hit it first if you're doing the smoked salmon. You do that. So that's a great way of upscaling an event. You're yeah. having some of those butlered. So people are getting it. Most people aren't going to take a, you know, half the tray, but you're, you're butlering around, you're controlling, you know, how much of that is consumed while still upscaling, you know, the, the event. So again, just, and then think about how are you serving it? Are you putting, is it a spoodle? Is it something like if it, if there's a, a spoon that's being put into, um, if it is a buffet, you know, is it something that's controlled like a spoodle? It might be a, you know, a two ounce or three ounce spoodle that you're using as a serving where they can't take a, a, a ton of it. So are you controlling how they are, you know, serving it, the size yeah. of the plate, you know, how big a plate are they using? You know, it'd be like, there's all different kinds of ways of also controlling those costs or how much is being consumed by just what tools you use. I mean, again, there's so many things that are interconnected in terms of thoughts, in terms of how to control those, control that, uh, that need to be considered. No, I, I totally agree. And uh, I know one thing we learned uh, off the rip uh, as catering was we would put all the vegetables and stuff first, the vegetables and the rice and the starch be first on a, as you come down a buffet line and then those those uh, really nice proteins, uh, chicken and whatever it be, be toward the end. And then to uh, to your point, we would have a, a person at a carving station at the very end carving pot roast. Because you, you put pot roast with a cut meat out there, they're going to run through it. So there, there are uh, little cool ways to get around uh, those things when it comes to serving. I want to talk real quick about something I pulled up about. Uh, sure. and it's like 12, 12 reasons uh, why restaurants fail. Some of this research is done by Ohio State and Cornell University. So uh, number one is lack of vision. Uh, two is not enough industry, industry experience. Three is not enough operational capital, poor location, not knowing the numbers, inefficient menu pricing and planning, failing to adapt, being too trendy, high staff turnover rates, inconsistent food and service, not enough repeat customers, mixing family and business. I think out of that 12, we, we hit about eight without looking at the list at all because it just, it just it happens. There's a lot. You know, one of the things that you mentioned before, like I tell you, you know, here's some great, you know, live instances. So this morning I was I was working with a um, uh, a chef who they're working on a new menu. So they're wanting to put uh, they want to do short rib, boneless mm -hmm. short rib. They're looking to do a filling on a, uh, a, ra a ravioli. So first they're talking about short rib. And I'm like, when first I was OK, let me go take a look at short rib. But then I asked them, what are you doing with it? And as soon as they told me they're looking to do a filling with it on something like a ravioli, then I'm saying, well, why do you need short rib? We don't have, you're going to, it's going to be in a filling. It's going to be something that you want braised and pulled yep. and you're going to add spices and seasoning. I'm like, why don't we look at chuck neck? You know, which again, the beef chuck is what you do pot roast. There's no reason why you can't braise that, pull that. And you're looking at instead of $9 a pound for a boneless short rib, you're now looking at something closer to $4 a pound. So wow huge difference the same thing with oxtail you want to talk yeah. about oxtail oxtail is very expensive if you buy oxtail maybe it's you know wholesale around nine dollars a pound what is your yield on oxtail your yield might be what 30 or 40 percent you know on uh with the amount of bone and in the fat yeah right so the reason people like to use oxtail is because of the flavor all that yeah. collagen melts yeah. down it's got that richness why can't you cut it so why can't you use oxtail, do something like a, like a, a, a chuck neck, roast that, braise that off, and then mix them together so you do cost averaging. So instead of paying, which really is costing if you're just doing the meat for oxtail, and maybe it's costing you something like $15 a pound, you yeah. can start cutting that with a different meat. You still get that richness from it. But again, you're looking at the ingredients and how you might be able to still cut some costs 
and make some more money, but still offer a product that still delivers the flavor in what you're trying to do. No, it, it makes sense. And I think it just come from, like I said, on, on the uh, on the list right there, just lack of experience. Some right. chefs uh, or owners don't know how to pivot um, in a time like this. One one thing you brought up earlier was, was uh, eggs. Um, it, it's not really, I don't know. Can't really get around eggs. Um, <laughs> do the liquid eggs. <laughs> Right. I see people do the liquid eggs, uh, place like like a Waffle House or places this high volume breakfast with carry the liquid eggs all the time. But um, not being able to pivot was like number uh, number six or eight on here. Not being able to adapt to what's going on and being too trendy. That's one thing I see there in Atlanta. Uh, everybody's trying to go with the most trendiest foods, and and sometimes that hurts the operation. Operations I've been in before um, that, that that happened that happened a lot. It happened a lot. And I've, I've I've never I've never personally cooked. You said chuck neck. Yep, two way chuck neck. So it's uh, beef chuck. I mean, think of uh, basically okay. it's the same uh, chuck, the same two way or three way chuck. It's the same piece of meat you would do a pot roast with. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I got you. I got you. I got you. Some people did, just might not even know what that is. You guys have some awesome. Um, I mean, there's products. I mean, this there's. Site is amazing. It's 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 fantastic. I mean, look, I'm talking, and here's the other thing too. When you talk about labor issues, um, it was the uh, same. We were talking about um, different menu item. They're looking to put on the menu. They want to put a chicken on the menu. So first, they we're talking about airline chicken uh, to put on the menu. Which again, it's you know you pay a little more of a premium for you know. Then that's the breast with the uh, the first joint uh, on it. Right. Um, but then she was worried about you know cooking it or getting the right temp on it and if it's going to hold. We happen to have a fantastic a half chicken product that's actually already sous vide that an operator all they need to do is drop it in the fryer drop oh. it in the fryer it's already cooked it's going to crisp up the skin you know it's a half chicken um it's a one and a quarter pound portion very consistent and it's impossible to mess up it's impossible to mess up it's quick to get out um i've got it on i think at least three or four different customers menus and they sell, they go through cases of it a week because it's great at being able to execute. It's always tender. It's that consistency. And it's fast out of the kitchen. You know, you ever get that table turn. Wow. And I, I'll be the first one to say I've never sous vide uh, any product. I, I, haven't. I haven't. There's a movie called uh, Burnt, and uh, the guy had a big problem with this chef. Um, it was like, you guys are putting food inside of condoms and boiling them. <laughs> so I was like, oh, CV. I never, I never did it before, but it sounds like a, a really awesome product. And I encourage people to definitely um, check out his website. I can sit here and browse. It, it's so much stuff on here. From, there is, it's just everything tremendous. we're talking about is is, is like listed from from uh, op operational solutions uh, to recipes to menu solutions. Everything is laid out man, on his website. This is absolutely. There's amazing. so much information and then looking at trends you know what's trending in the market i mean what butter is a big trend right now butter boards i don't know butter boards if you're doing catering mm. butter is butter's big so you're taking butter and then adding different ingredient to the butter spices to yeah. the butter so you would do a board like breakfast boards breakfast boards were i think a, a year ago where you know just like you know instead of doing the cheese board you had a breakfast board you had pancakes and sausage and presenting it on a mm. board so that became a big trend. Butterboards are kind of what's big now where you're able to do, maybe it's a couple of different, whether it's crostinis or crackers or whatever that is. And then a couple of different types of butter. You're taking your, you know, your unsalted, you know, sweet butter and yeah. then adding some ingredient to it, whether it's pesto butter or sun-dried tomato butter. And then you have a board with the different spreads based on butter and putting that out. Again, that's kind of becoming a big trend right now on the, on the butterboards. Butterboard. I think butter I saw that before too. Yeah, I think I seen. What was it? Butter? Or was it? Uh, was it cheese they had? Did um, I forgot what I had saw? But they basically had. Uh, they made it look like a like like a candle, but it was actually mm -hmm. cheese. And they put the wick inside of it. It, it was it was it looked, it looked it weird, but uh, to my point, there's a lot of great ideas out there that people can get. There are people doing it with butter. Yeah. I've had someone do a duck fat candle before. I've seen that in competition, do a duck, duck fat, fat candle, candle, render the duck fat, put a wick in it, and they actually serve the dish with a, uh, 
a duck fat candle, which then they poured, and then you had to pour that on uh, as a finish kind of on the thing. You poured some of the duck fat on it. So that was kind of a, a cool presentation. Wow. Yep, duck fat candle. Wow, that is crazy. Um, let's see what else over here. So I'm try, trying to pull up this, uh, this Facebook page because it, w- it was some interesting uh, things they had going on here. As mm-hmm. And I wish they could all of them tune in. I'm going to keep commenting for the group. Uh, but the group is called... Um, Restaurant manager slash chef owners. We got like forty-seven thousand people in this group. Um, so they had questions about POS operating systems. Uh, that's something people don't know about. I think people kind of go with is it called Toast? That's been I think uh, we've I've seen a lot. I mean, Micros is still out there. There's um, uh, a number of different versions of it. I mean, there's Aloha, but I think. A lot of, I mean, what I've seen gain a lot of popularity is Toast because of its ease of integration and, um, it, you know, all the different options they have. But Toast, I think, seems to be what I think a lot of my customers have migrated to uh, just because of the the type of systems, the handhelds. There's a lot of flexibility yeah. with that system and a lot of integration. Yeah, I see. So this, uh, I should pull it over here. but this page, man, uh, Questions about servers, turnover, uh, best place to buy bar mats. You guys do stuff like that too, bar mats and material as well? We bought an entire um, small wares and equipment company called Supplies on the Fly. So Cisco bought their own company, which handles, I mean, we do from furniture to heavy equipment to hoods, walk-in refrigerators, bar mats, definitely, uh, floor mats, um, anti-fatigue mats wiper mats i mean any kind of mat that i mean we basically have access to every product outside of gas like to follow your to, to fire up your uh, your co2 si- or your uh, soda systems yeah um and alcohol for the most part outside of those we pretty much do everything Damn. yeah i mean and then and getting to equipment there's um and there's so many resources again we talked a bit before and like there's so which is one of the advantages of going through broadline distribution is it's about value for your money. So if you're buying a product, wouldn't it be great to be able to um, buy product that you know there's support behind it, you know, where you have um, whether a broker or a, sale, a sales consultant coming in, kind mm-hmm. to go over what those uses are or how to use it. Or again, if there's, you know, we used to sell fry oil that has, you um, they call them dividers. Basically, it's a it's something you would put in your fryer that collects all the debris that that from the breakdown of whatever you're frying. And then to extend the life of your oil, you would take your baskets out. You just bang out the uh, the uh, uh, the metal uh, unit that was collecting all the debris, and you had extra long. You get an extra day or two, you know, with your fry life out of it. You know, so that was something that some of these manufacturers were putting out for users, you know, that bought that oil. But again, you know, you need to get exposure to what that is, or, you know, how many people are straining the oil, putting it through a China cap with a, with a filter, you know, like all those kind of tricks and, and um, different methods of handling, to, which again, translate into you being a better operator, saving money, you know, um, especially in that case with oil, having to use less. And oil now is almost $50, a, you know, a container. Yeah, that's I mean, it's making you have to go down to use it for, is it canola oil? The other, the oil that I hate, I think it's canola oil. Yeah, it's um, soybean. It's soybean. Soybean oil. Yeah, that's, that's. I know you're going with it. Yeah, it's that's, soybean. That's not even safe. And I actually thought thought about that a couple of years ago when I ate, ate at McDonald's. It was years ago. I'm like, something tastes weird with, their, with the fries. Is it the fries? It was the grease. Well, now, now I know it's the fries too, uh, what they use now. But a couple of the restaurants, I'm like, the oil is tasting weird. It's because of the oil prices are shooting up. They had to switch over to soybean oil. So that's that's what you're getting there, people. You're getting soybean oil fried food all over the place. So and there's really no way around that. You know, one of those big chain restaurants and you do a lot of frying. Uh, I don't think there's no way around other than paying a fifty dollars per gallon or for the big plastic drum of uh, oil. So unless you go with uh solidified oil, I think that's a little bit cheaper, isn't it? I mean, if you go with the solids, I would say very few companies probably use solids anymore. I mean, if you want to go back to back old school with McDonald's, one of the people, one of the reasons why people used to love those fries is they cooked in beef tallow. 
granted, they stopped that, you know, a number really? of years. They used to cook in beef tallow. You want to talk about a stable oil. It's really stable, but then it's all the animal fat and the hydrogenation, and it became yeah. a, you know, a less than a healthy oil, but it was, it was great. That's why you cook <laughs> duck fat. I mean, it's delicious when you talk about, you know, animal fat versus, yeah. you know, vegetable fat. It's a whole yeah. different, you know, type of product, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, oil is, is, is huge. I mean, there's so much product that's being fried and then there's all different kinds of oil. Then you got into the hydrogenation of it. You know, is it a stronger oil than others? Like, you know, peanut oil, you know, peanut oil, you know, is a fantastic oil it has a high smoke point, high heat. It won't break yeah. down or last longer, but then everybody's scared of allergies. So, you know, oh, it's, yeah. you know, it's more expensive, but it holds up. It's a stronger oil. It's good flavor, you know, but uh, I forgot yeah. where the oil question was going. But <laughs> That's fine. But it, it, it's typically when we fry our turkeys in for Thanksgiving all the time. It's peanut oil yep. due to the fact of, of how good it is. What this is. So um, with that, with that prolonging it, so next time we talk, we're going to bring somebody on that's going to talk about um, PASA, right? Or just putting those processes in place, correct? Yeah, so I know we were talking, uh, one of the guests, uh, gentleman and, and his wife who have been running a company for many many years that are doing passive training they do tips training for bars they do um uh they do all kinds of certification food handler uh, certification and one of the things that we spoke of that i thought was very powerful was in addition to learning the safe ways of handling and cooking product it was something that the smaller uh, operator who might be a, a caterer someone who might be uh, a private chef um, can use by getting that type of certification is to create separation between yourself and others where if you're going to a client and you're presenting your menu to say, by the way, I also have my certification. I'm certified in, in proper food handling. And the last thing you would want to do in talking to, you know, that your, your potential customer would want is to have their guests become sick or become ill. And the fact that you as an operator, as a you know small business, have that certification are able to say, look, I know how to handle it. Does the other companies that you're talking to, the other private chefs, do they do they have that certification? So I think that's a great way of one learning the proper ways of, of preparing Absolutely. and holding and purchasing. But on the flip side on how to make money, you can use that as a very powerful tool to bring people your way to to uh, contract with you because you have that certification. Yeah, and that's one of the things that set people apart or chefs. This one thing that I'm, I'm gonna make sure that, that chefs understand is being certified. Uh, this is a certified driven industry along with like nursing and barbering and anything else you use your hands. Um, I was reading an article one time at, at culinary school that Walt Disney at one point in time were, were adamant about hiring people who came through trade school with certification versus people with degrees. And one of the reasons were, if we hire somebody with a degree, we have to then retrain them to touch right. this equipment. Somebody who's certified already touched the equipment, they're certified in it. So I want people to, to, to get a, a bad, uh, bad connotation about certification versus degrees. If you have a chance to get a degree, always you know get your education, but certification is gonna carry a, long, a long, longer way. And this is in food service industry, in my opinion, um, I'm real big on certifications. I'm, I'm certified in a lot. I don't even certify it, but certified proctor. I can give you the exam and show you how to do the exam. That's something I'm picking off too that I'll. Uh, So certification, you would need to get started from, I don't know, from the health department all the way up to your LLC, all to your mission statements and business plans, all of it. Um, if you just need that, that help, uh, let me know. Um, also, chefs, and people that want to watch this, if you're looking at making some extra cash, man, why not sign up the Avenue? Like, 
what you got any questions? This is this is a great platform to sign up for. If you have any questions, I sign up. Shoot me an email, okay? Email me right now. I'll send you a link, and we have to make on here and actually do that. That's what we, that's what we should do next. We, we should, we talk about do, it. Yeah, not just talk about it, but actually, I, I can pull it up and we can just walk through how to sign up for it, some of the benefits of it. There's some of some of the stuff we do not talk about enough. As a matter of fact, bring it up right now. Um, a live performance coming up. A competition, sorry, not performance. Uh, Breaking Bread is one of the competitions coming up here. Breaking Bread so, is going to be coming up in June. Um, I know you've been on some of those meetings, but we had Breaking Bread coming up. We're working on doing our first Breaking Bread Kids. Um, last time we ran Breaking Bread, we gave away, or I was just a giveaway. There was close to $25,000 that paid out to the chefs that participated. That's a national program. Um, in collaboration with uh, Black Food Life, um, also with uh, Black Chef Network, and uh, we're planning on with OKC Black Eats as well. Again, it's a national program uh, that we're working on that. There's also a whole bunch of bartending uh, comps, mini comps that are coming up uh, that we have starting. Actually, the first one's going to be starting in February, and we're also having mini comps coming up for the culinary, for the people in culinary, which is called Plate It. It hasn't been posted yet, but Plated is coming um, starting in, uh, in uh, I think it's going to be March. March will be the beginning of Plated, which we're going to be giving away prizes every month uh, for those people that post their videos, share them. They get the most tips, uh, and then they're going to start keeping those tips. Um, they'll also get prizes. We have prizes from Ecolab. We're having stuff coming from Spiceology. Uh, we're working on some other ones, but uh, again, this is something that's, very different than the other social media platforms. It's a platform that we built for the culinary industry, for the hospitality industry, to be able to really showcase what they can do uh, and to be able to share with others and, and be supported. I mean, we've given uh, through our competitions, almost $100,000 have been paid out uh, through various chefs and bartenders around the world. So again, this is something that we built for you all uh, to be able to use and hopefully share with others uh, that can use it. Side of, of, of getting uh, Steve up here talking about pass up. Maybe give like the, maybe the first half, the first I don't know, 35, 40 minutes, maybe the last 20 minutes or so to really um, start sharing how to get on the avenue, how to sign up, how to log in, how to do all that great creative stuff with the platform to get people excited about it. So, um, but that. That about does it for our time. We've got about three minutes to try to hit our hour mark. Definitely appreciate it this time. I'm looking forward to getting back on here. Uh, I would say once a month. If you can swing twice a month, that'd be great. But, but at least once a month. I know for me, uh, for February, my schedule is going to be crazy. I'm speaking at over, I don't know, almost 10, 10 high schools locally. Um, I have been asked to do, I, it came out of nowhere. That's why I've been slamming all day yesterday, right now, uh, getting the other PowerPoint. And, I'm going out to talk to them. I think a lot of schools are about to get ready to re-implement certain programs back in school, like, like, like uh, culinary, right. I mean, like high schools. Um, We're talking about ProStart as well. ProStart has those type of programs. So we've been in conversation with ProStart, yeah. part of the Restaurant Association Educational Foundation. But absolutely. Wow. I know they bring the culinary back. I think they're thinking about uh, stuff like auto mechanics and woodshop coming back to schools or whatever the case is. That's great. Because, yeah, yeah, I know. Our kids are... It's not on the game system. They don't, they don't know how to put anything together. But but anyway, they, they, they've reached out to me, these different schools, middle schools and high schools, to come out and talk to the uh, local uh, kids about work workforce development, um, kind of entrepreneur stuff. Um, and one of my in my PowerPoint, I have to have you uh, listen to my PowerPoint because kids love to, to hop on Instagram and TikTok and do something. Like, why not get paid by doing it? You're in school. You're in the ninth, 10th grade. <laughs> Loans of the material is, is, is productive and, it, and it's cool. That why not hop on the avenue and it's just what you can do. And I have about, I think, 60 students uh, interested in going into culinary program. I don't have a program, per se, to put them, in, to put them into culinary, but one of the things that I want to talk to the schools about is, is uh, I think out of the six schools, three have culinary art programs as to possibly host something with those schools on the avenue. I don't look, I, I talked to you offline about it, but yeah, we just, love that. Just trying to shape it. So I can present it, but I'm going to be talking from February all the way through uh, March 15th, um, all, almost every every week. 
I got a school everything that I go to. So that's going to be super exciting. So I'm going to have some materials to lead them with. And the avenue is definitely something I'm going to mention to them to hop on and um, show them how to make some quick money. You know, kids are all for they hit a buck to grow nothing else. So, um, but anyway, thank, thanks again, Eric. I appreciate it. And uh, let's let's uh, probably hop on a, a Zoom call this week and let's talk with Steve. And uh, I, I'd rather have you, you know, kind of have you there uh, sure. along with the conversation so we can and I can take some good notes and start to structure uh, these lives to where I can kind of post course material we can talk about a cover a couple people tapped in and out here today i think the last one we did got a lot of traction this one probably gets attracted too as we you know go along but i, I want to kind of keep it consistent when we do like once or twice a month and put out some great information um to everybody and probably cover more in depth on how to do certain procedures like food costing and getting into those menu development pieces and just really just drill that on i have a powerpoint for a lot of this stuff too. I can pull up along the way. We kind of talk through the PowerPoint uh, without giving too much away because shit, you know, can't give all, can't give everything away. But <laughs> I want them to walk away with a good bit of information, um, uh, understanding how to do it. Because I'm telling you, there are tons and tons of up and coming chefs and, and chefs out there who are not in the restaurant industry who has they have no reason to to get a Cisco account uh, because their operation is nowhere near big enough to do that. But they still you know these these vital things that we discussed and talked about on here. I want it to be for everybody. And I'm going to tap back into that, that restaurant group on Facebook. Shoot them a message and see if you can go live from their page. Because you got 48,000 people on there. And a lot of those people are restaurant owners. And the questions they got, man, are just like, how do you keep employees engaged? High turnover rate? How to, how to you know, put up W-2s for employees? What system are you using? Like, that, that list of things where a restaurant fails, I can see the questions on the uh, feed on Facebook. Like, Jesus Christ. Uh, a lot of those places, I think two places, they had to close down. They were like in Maryland somewhere. They had to close down the operation due to the fact that they still trying to recover from COVID and just never caught their wind from uh, food costs going up. So I think there's a lot of opportunity out there to continue to have these conversations and talk to people and get them, in, and get them engaged. That's something I want to do. I want, I want to get people engaged more. Uh, on yeah, the bring them on. Let them ask their questions. Like, tell us what their yeah. challenges, their struggles are. I mean, that's that's what I do every day. <laughs> is I, I I deal with with them. I I talk to them about, you know, what what's the, what are the answers? What is the suggestions? You know, to help manage the situation. A hundred percent. For sure, for sure. And when you guys watch this. Be sure to go to Instagram and follow the Avenue Live. Tap in uh, with the Avenue Live and get ready for the break and break coming. It's a lot of stuff coming up on the website. It's one of There's those a lot stuff. coming. There's a lot coming up, man. Including a lot uh, every Thursday this month of Black History Month. I'm covering. Uh, a pretty uh, significant dope chefs starting this coming Thursday all the way through February. Now, I, my March calendar is filling up now with uh, Chef Willis. Uh, that was Dwayne's Wade uh, chef. Uh, chef Willis is, is Kanye's chef. Um, but I got uh, Kanye West chef. I got uh, Dwayne's Wade chef. I'm working on getting a couple other chefs. Uh, French Montana, getting his personal chef. I'm getting all the chefs that I know personally who are currently cooking for celebrities and they're pretty popular on Instagram and famous and uh, working on those uh, those just drops for you too to get everybody over here. So great things coming to the Avenue, man. Great things coming. Chef J. Palmer, Chef in your Academy. If you're interested in joining, shoot me an email. Just scroll across the bottom. Uh, Eric, again, thanks, man. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Time. Anytime you need me. You got let's, it. Let's uh, tap back in this week. I have to get I have to take it in, man. I got to get up in the morning and do my, my first lecture at 9 o'clock at this, this high school. Back to school, yeah. right? <laughs> back to school. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be super excited. So thanks again, man. I appreciate you. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so at least once a month, uh, maybe twice a month on Tuesdays, we'll be sure to you guys get the information. We're going to try to go live and put out some good stuff. Next time we talk, we'll talk about HACCP. Um, and not only HACCP, why HACCP is important. Uh, and if we have time, we'll get into uh, uh, some inventory uh, cost control issues and stuff like that. Again, just talking about the issues that are in the industry right now that people are facing, want to kind of uh, highlight and bring a voice to those who don't know what to do, or maybe just don't know what the right question to ask. So be sure to shoot me an email now. Get those questions rolled so we can address those questions and issues um, that you may have. And, you know, just, just talk back to us. This is a platform to kind of have those conversations. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for your time. Chef Ponder, out.